Sir Abjad, Pom Pom Kitty, hello. I hope you're doing well. I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, everybody who's watching this later too, whenever you see this, hear this, uh, I hope navigating the world today on whatever day you hear this is easy for you. Uh, and I hope you can share that ease with others. For anybody that's joining Brain Tech Support Live for the first time, we explore how to have human brains and how to have all of the experiences that human brains can throw up for us as we take ourselves through the wilderness of life uh, and also navigate all of the different challenges that the wilderness of life uh, can throw at us or that we can experience. So welcome. So feel free to share any questions about your adventures through the world with the human brain. Feel free to share any uh, yeah, experiences you've had, things you've discovered on your journey lately. As we're getting into things, uh, so just want to emphasize to anybody who's here today, well, also anybody watching later, I will be in uh, starting in April-ish, I'll be in uh, Turkey and Europe and uh, the UK um, through like through several months. We'll do like peer support groups and workshops and you know maybe hike around, meditate, eat donuts in a park, all sorts of different possibilities. So uh, I'll, like, I'll keep everybody updated on as things get uh, finalized and sorted out. But also anybody listening to this, uh, yeah, if you want to collaborate on something, you're part of a mental health organization, uh, you have some other type of thing uh, you think it'd be fun uh, to collaborate on. Of course, I do things with all sorts of different types of organizations, not just mental health organizations. Let me know. Yeah reach out, uh, we can talk about it, and uh, we can see what will work well. And I'll keep everybody posted on the different types of events and things like that uh, to come. Saeed, hello. I hope you're doing well today too. One of the things I am excited to look at as explore doing like workshops and, and uh, events and things like that uh, this coming spring and summer is that as much as possible, any kind of, uh, or for many of the events, some will be different, but for many of the events that, that kind of learning and you know doing some exercises and things like that uh, will happen on your own uh, before the event so that when we get together, it can be more focused on you know, having a human experience and interaction. Uh, rather than just uh, having your face in, uh, you know, a bunch of uh, exercises or something like that that you could uh, easily do somewhere else on your own. In winter, welcome Pom Pom Kitty. So when am I planning to visit India? So I, I did a bunch of workshops uh, before. When the workshops in India would have been in 2019, maybe? I think so, yeah. Yeah, 2019. Um, they were great. So we did a, a bunch of workshops in, uh, in Delhi, in uh, Hyderabad, and uh, visited Bangalore. We did a little, uh, we did like a Q&A there. And I feel like I did, I did uh, go to one other place and do workshops. Um, but uh, I have, I hope to visit India again. I couldn't do India on this adventure because at the time to plan and book things, uh, Canadians couldn't get visas to India, and there was no indication of when that would uh, change. Now uh, we can uh, get visas to India, but I've already had to start uh, booking things. So I wasn't able to uh, plan India in on this trip, but uh, yeah, we'll stop by India in the future. Taj said, uh, I think I should share my recent experience. I've been in recovery for quite some time, but recently I went through a traumatic event, a loss for the first time during recovery. It brought up a lot of old feelings. 
I fell into trying to fix this because it hadn't felt this way in such a long time. But I quickly got back on the path and came out better than I was before in terms of recovery. Yeah, Touch, thanks for sharing about that. What you, and this is like, really, thank you for sharing that because it's so useful for people to hear, um, to expect similar things to happen. Change, loss, those are the kinds of things that uh, we can really struggle with. And so it's really natural when there's a, tra a traumatic event and a loss that will just have that, that reflex to some old habits. Being able to understand that, being able to see where that comes from is such skillful awareness and so useful so that we don't get caught up in this, oh no, I'm doing these old habits or I'm experiencing these old feelings or these old thoughts. Because likewise, when something like that happens, we should also expect the brain to throw up a bunch of intrusive thoughts because uh, the brain is going to go, whoa, I don't know what's going on here. But I remember when we used to control stuff. Let's go back to some things we used to control. So it's a very, very common experience. And congratulations to you. Are you putting those skills in action? You saw what was going on. You saw how to handle that and bring yourself back to a path that's more useful. So yeah, congratulations. And thank you for sharing that. In winter, he said, how do you view the past as like, should we restrict our current actions because of the past experiences? Or should we focus on something different like values, which is better? Yeah, I don't even, even the, the, the premise or the belief that would make you ask that, I do not understand. Uh, and don't understand even why it's a choice there uh, between doing what we value or restricting our current actions because of the past. So uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't follow the logic there. So I, I would definitely go with the values. Emil, he said, do you know the term ROCD, having intrusive thoughts about your relationships? Yeah, I'm, I'm very familiar with the term. Eleven tree lover, eleven. You said so. I'm pretty deep in OCD, okay. And I know I have to hold things in life and do things I want to do, and I just don't know what those things are. I get so anxious that I don't know. So it's really natural uh, to want not know. Uh, so speaking of trees, I often explain this, and I use the metaphor at the start. I don't know if you caught it of of navigating the wilderness, like taking a hike in the wilderness. And life is a wilderness we have never hiked before. So there's, there's no reason we would know. I think people put a lot of pressure on themselves to know where they should go in life, uh, to know what they should do. But you, if this is your first life, and I know for many of you, probably, probably your first time around, uh, you, uh, there's no way you would know. And, and so it's totally okay. And so even that you're saying, I get so anxious that I don't know, implies that if you weren't anxious, you would know. But that would be impossible. Uh, if, if you weren't anxious, uh, you still wouldn't have ever hiked this journey of life before. Uh, so curiosity can really help in allowing ourselves to choose things, especially when we're really anxious. Being able to say, okay, like I'm, I'm really anxious right now. I'm not going to put this pressure on myself to have some big, grand plan and be clairvoyant and predict the future and something like that. Instead though, what if we just pick some things and they don't have to be the right things. They don't have to be about controlling the universe in the future, but some things that are just kind to ourselves to explore. And so I call these festivals of curiosity and we pick something for maybe a month. We just say, yeah, I don't, I don't there's a lot going on right now. So what's something that would make my life easier? Uh, like maybe making breakfast. Like, what if I, okay, I don't know what to do with all this stuff, but what if I just focus on breakfast for a month? And that's all I have to do, because I know that's really going to support me. And maybe after a month of supporting myself, I'll find another thing to support myself. Because uh, that supporting on its own, we know is going to be valuable. Just allowing something to be easy and supportive and not needing to control the entire universe. Okay. 
can be a real kindness. KCP, welcome. Thanks for stopping by. It's good to see you. Emel said, I struggle with intrusive thoughts about my relationship since we're in a long distance relationship. I love him so much, so it's so painful. And he said, it's been six months that I have ROCD and it became better. And this month I saw my boyfriend for three weeks. It was amazing. And yesterday he came back to Canada and me in France and I'm so sad. And my intrusive thoughts are more powerful the last few days. That's understandable, uh, especially if you're uh, separated from each other. It can be useful to see that ROCD isn't just about the intrusive thoughts. Like the intrusive thoughts require us to be doing a bunch of compulsions, maybe even to like notice an uncertainty and then spend a lot of time thinking about it, checking feelings, checking you know messages from the partner, etc. Uh, you know, thinking back to experiences, trying to think about the future. There's all sorts of compulsions that go into it. And so it can be really useful to explore interacting with those experiences differently and not doing the compulsions because actually the compulsions, you know, like trying to get reassurance, for instance, it's not actually going to give us reassurance. It's going to create more uncertainty, which is going to make us do more compulsions, which is going to create even more uncertainty and it spirals out. Um, so yeah, if you can grab, you know, a good workbook or work with a skilled professional, starting to learn about interacting with uncertainty around relationships differently can be really useful. Starting to shift the focus to what do we want to create in the relationship. Having a set of shared relationship values becomes especially important when there is increased distance and uncertainty in a relationship. Uh, so that can be really useful to explore. And those values are about actions, really concrete actions that you're both going to do to care for the relationship, but also care for yourselves. Uh, so allowing for some uncertainty, allowing for that space. Um, so yeah, it's uh, really natural when we care about somebody that we end up starting to do a lot of compulsions because we really care. And as Tash pointed out, yeah, which is a great reminder. So sometimes you just have to go through it while staying on the path and keeping the tools, you know. Indeed. Aurora said, I'm having a horrible time with panic attacks and DPDR, uh, so depersonalization, derealization, and feeling like I can't function with these feelings. Driving is awful because I feel like I'm going to crash and I'm so scared tips so it can really help to see uh depersonal de depersonalization and derealization as well as panic attacks involve a lot of compulsions a lot of compulsions to get things right to check feelings and judge them uh, so dpdr great example of how checking and trying to get a right feeling just makes us feel wrong all the time same with panic attacks panic attacks so like doing a lot of checking judging around our feelings, of course, then the feelings are wrong, which then creates more anxiety, more desire to control, and that spirals up into a panic attack. It'll be really useful to explore things you like to feel right about, starting to look at all of the different controlling and checking that goes on around right feelings. Uh, yeah, if... Um, you can access somebody to work with or a good workbook or something like that. Like it's really common to run into those uh, compulsions around driving, uh, like trying to make sure we're not going to have a panic attack, avoiding driving. Really, really common. Lots of people uh, have shared about them before on the Mental Fitness Discord server and have also shared about the driving exercises they do to overcome them. But... It's not just about doing some driving and kind of like forcing it uh, because we've got to cut out all of those compulsions we're doing around checking our experience and judging it as right or wrong and trying to control it. Uh, so yeah, starting to learn about the compulsions we do to check and make things right and then how to start cutting them out uh, could be really useful. So one thing I'd say if that 
sounds scary because of the driving. Always when somebody brings up panic attacks and depersonalization, derealization, the first thing I always ask them is, what else do you like to get right in life? Um, it can really help to see that this stuff that may be distressing is the outcome of lots of other behaviors that seemed necessary and probably likable to get things right. And so there's actually a lot of areas where you can start to make changes that may seem easier. Uh, and at the same time, they may also seem like unnecessary because you'd be like, well, no, I'm, it's these things that are freaking me out, not this other stuff. I like this other stuff or I don't care about it, but it's actually that stuff we don't care about. It doesn't seem like a big deal which creates the logic for the brain to obsess about the bigger stuff. Because the brain goes, well, if you like to get this stuff right, we definitely have to get existence and reality right and driving right, because these are things that can be dangerous. Uh, so yeah, look at where the brain learned to get things right. That's where I would start to make changes. Adela said, I know this was told so many times, but lately I'm doing so many things out of my comfort zone. And sometimes it is too much. And my brain is throwing up so many old thoughts and feelings. And then I'm so scared to go back and I have this big fear of the past and panic attacks and so on. And now Adele, you, you mentioned there that you know it's been said uh, so many times. And so I'm, I'm curious, yeah, what do you have a specific question because you probably already it sounds like know exactly what I would say on this topic is there a specific question that maybe uh, you're wondering about I maze tech you said any tips on the best way to deal with uncertainty yes do not deal with it it doesn't need any dealing the uncertainty is just there and that's it we don't have to do anything with it so much of the problems come from having an experience and going oh this I need to do something with this, but it's not a thing we can do anything with. And then so then we create lots of struggle and then we do more checking and more controlling and it explodes into like I was just talking about a panic attack, for example. Panic attacks are great examples of hating on experiences, trying to control experiences we don't control and then getting more anxious because we don't control the experience we don't control, but we want to control it. We want to deal with it. But if we just have the experience, go, oh, there's nothing I have to do here. It's much easier. Chris Slays, hello, thanks for joining us. Sarabja said, just an observation. When you've been triggered by an intrusive thought and you don't rectify it by doing compulsions, and later on, when you have more intrusive thoughts and triggers, rectifying the previous intrusive experience seems irrelevant. Sometimes it takes more intrusive thoughts for the brain for you to realize the previous intrusive thought was irrelevant. And we need to focus on present intrusive thought, which is now the task at hand, ex except we don't have to focus on the present intrusive thought either. But you already know that uh, you're going to see it's irrelevant. So we can, we can speed that process up by recognizing all of the stuff in our heads is uh, irrelevant now. In winter, yeah, you said, how does mindfulness values and cutting out the compulsions are related or are they just the same thing? Um, well, I mean, they could be. Uh, mindfulness is the practice of being in the present. Um, and having experiences without slapping all of the extra judgments and controlling on them. Uh, so that's very useful. And that is cutting out a bunch of compulsions. Values, though I would say, are, are more... Yeah, so here, to use the example earlier, I mentioned the wilderness. So values are us picking directions in the wilderness. So values, there's this huge wilderness here, and we're like, okay, there's so many things I could go. Oh, I see there's like a mountain over there and I think there's a lake down there. I can hear a river. Uh, there's like a nice forest over there with like a lot of, a bunch of pine trees. And that could be really nice to go. And I hear there's some like rare plants down in this other direction. Values are picking the direction. Whichever direction I go, 
whether I go up the mountain, I go to look at the rare plants, I go down to the, the lake and canoe or to the river and do some kayaking. Whichever direction I pick, I'm going to practice mindfulness. I want to be present with that experience. So values, you could say, are the direction. Mindfulness is the way we do the direction. And then the compulsions are all the stuff we don't do. So if I uh, go to the lake to do some canoeing and I practice being present, uh, well, I canoe because that's a really enjoyable thing to do and I want to give my attention to it. Uh, the compulsions, like say, like ruminating on some past conversation or uh, you know, checking if somebody likes me or something like that or trying to make sure I don't have a panic attack while I canoe. Those are just things that I'm not going to do. Just like also, if I get in the canoe, I'm not going to bring my firing pan and hit myself in the face with it. Uh, there's all sorts of things we can choose to not do uh, when we're canoeing. But I'm going to choose the values instead. So yeah, you could always look at values and like compulsions are the opposite of values. So if we're doing the values, we are just inherently or naturally uh, not doing the compulsions. So Amel, you said, what do you suggest uh, to do when you have intrusive thoughts? So the thing is, we don't have to do anything with them. Uh, what we can do, I find much more useful, is to be growing something. Giving that time and energy to something we want to see in the world, rather than trying to fix and control something we don't want to see. So when intrusive thought pops up, usually we're then taking the time and energy we'd give to life, and instead trying to clean our minds. You can look at intrusive thoughts as like a contamination. So we might not see it as the same as a hand washing uh, compulsion. So we may see, somebody may say ROCD is different from say contamination OCD, but it can really help to see that they're the same. We'll have an intrusive thought say about a partner uh, disliking us. And then we try to clean it away. Uh, trying to do that stuff to get rid of it is what makes it worse. So instead, when that thought pops up or when that contamination is there, we're like, oh, this feels wrong. We go, okay, well, this feels wrong. And I'm going to go in and give my attention to something I actually want to see in the world. And that feeling can come with me. So that's the work of allowing it to be there. So the thought pops up, we're like, all right, I can have that thought and it can come along with me. I'm going to put it in my pocket and go and do something else. Quinn. Oh, he said, who is the best meditation teacher to learn from? Would you recommend Sam Harris in Waking Up? What do you think about certain people having DP from intense meditation? It seems like a Band-Aid. Um, yeah, Quinn, can you, what, what do you, when you say it seems like a Band-Aid, can you explain what you mean? And also, um, uh, when you ask, so the, the, I'm not going to have a, any kind of answer as who is the best meditation to learn from. Like even kind of uh, seeking something like that isn't even, like I can say, so as somebody who meditates a lot and, you know, attends meditation retreats and things like that often, uh, sure, like a teacher can have, uh, yeah, maybe some impact. But it's really important to recognize that the practice exists separate from the teacher. Like I'd really watch out for going like, I'm looking for like the best teacher and I'm going to kind of like glom on to that teacher or something like that or their teachings. Uh, meditation has been around for a very long time. And so, yeah, I would say this to everybody. Like I would encourage you to explore and understand meditation separate from any one teacher. That would be the place I'd start. But yeah, Quinn, what do you mean by it seems like a Band-Aid? Uh, which is, what is the it? FH. Oh, you said, I watch nearly everything about OCD. Do you also have any tips specifically for ADHD or should I continue with your tips for great overall mental health? Okay, so um, watching things about OCD or it could be ADHD or anything is not the same as doing things. It'd be like watching all of the videos on weightlifting. It's fine, but we must lift the weights. I, I, so I would, yeah, not, and this is the approach I always take, I don't focus on any particular, you know, acronym. 
or something like that, the place I would always start is what, what are the things you want to be growing and creating in life? Any tips are going to be about those on the way to growing and creating that stuff. Yeah, we're going to navigate all sorts of challenges. We might have some physical illness, mental illness, uh, environmental uh, disasters, collapse of society, all sorts of things like that to handle on the way to growing and giving the things we want to give. But any tips I would always say should be about what it is you want to create rather than trying to clean away a specific acronym. Eleven Tree Lover Eleven he said, I've been struggling with harm OCD and I keep trying to figure out how to get out of this. I keep trying to figure out what's the best exposures, but also work on beliefs that are making this stay alive. If you have any advice. So I just watch her keeping in mind there's a difference between exposure therapy and exposure and response prevention therapy. If somebody has harm OCD, I've never met anybody with harm OCD who wasn't exposed. The exposure has happened. If you had an intrusive thought about something terrible happening, that's the exposure. Now you got to cut out the compulsion. Now comes the response prevention piece. Uh, so yeah, depending on the harm OCD thing, uh, like there's a video on my channel on a knife. Uh, oh, it's called, if you, you'll find it, it's not that long ago. I remember I did it, I was in Mexico City at this great kitchen, had really good knives. Uh, but yeah, if you look it up on my channel, just like harm, I think if you just put like, you just type harm Mark Freeman or something like that. Um, it'll pop up. And uh, I don't think YouTube will, will flag you as, as trying to do something dangerous for that. Uh, or yeah, if you just search through the videos, you'll see it. I'm like holding a knife in the, the video thumbnail. Wes Jackson. Hello, thanks for stopping by. Magdalena said, when something causes fear in us just by looking at it, should we stop looking, stop thinking and focus on something else or look specifically to learn to be in that fear? It's one of the things that can really uh, catch us because if we start to see fear as this contamination, we should clean away. So we look for a right approach to fear. But I would bring it back to what you actually want to be doing there. Does looking at the fear help you move in a direction you want to move? Because otherwise it's actually, actually stopping to look at it is the compulsion because it's taking you away from living your life. Like if I'm going to the grocery store, so I'm going to go to the grocery store, I'm going to get some delicious donuts to nourish myself. Actually, I wouldn't get donuts at the grocery store, but this is a hypothetical metaphor. Uh, and on the way to the donuts at the grocery store, I saw a red car and I'm afraid of red cars. So if I go, oh, okay, I'm afraid of red cars. So I'm going to stare at the red car to get over my fear. And I'm going to keep staring at this red car until the fear goes away. I might be staring at the red car until the grocery store closes and still the fear won't have gone away. And now I've actually missed out on something that would be useful to me. There's, there's no requirement for us to overcome a feeling. We, we can have feelings. We can have fear. The only time I would look at specific exercises around something like that is if it is specific to something we want to be growing in our lives. Uh, for instance, if somebody really wants to be a musician, but they notice that they really struggle singing in front of other people, then yeah, then, because we say, look, they, they really want to be a musician, and they're doing all of these compulsions around the feelings that come up when they sing in front of other people. So yeah, then we're going to do a whole bunch of exercises uh, around singing in front of other people, probably doing a lot of other things in front of other people because it won't just be about singing because uh, that's very directly in the path. Um, so that's what I'd look at there. Fisher Boy. 
So when having intrusive thoughts, I accept them and don't judge them while doing what I want to do and use mindfulness skills to refocus my attention on what I want to do. But at times it feels like I'm pushing away thoughts. Is this normal? I can normally just have the thought and snap back to what I want to do, but don't want to push thoughts away either in a voice. Yeah, so there is a recent video on this topic and it might be the, maybe, maybe the most recent or, no, 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 not the most recent, but maybe two or three videos ago. Uh, so yeah, I'd suggest checking that out because that idea of like, oh, am I pushing away a thought? Because I would say, is that because there'd be, you'd be doing something wrong if you're pushing it away? And so watch it. This is a way the brain loves to hook us back in um, to, uh, you know, checking what we're doing in our heads and making sure we get it right because we want to get recovery right so we don't relapse and have a bad experience again. And then it's already got us back into reacting to a fear. Elizabeth, yeah, you said, so it's not a compulsion to think that nature is nice. Nature is very nice. It's a, just a fact. Nature is wonderful. We could definitely spend more time in nature. I almost actually, <laughs> there's a TV right behind me, and because there's this TV here, I tried to see if I could put a nature documentary on the TV, but then uh, I decided it was a bit too distracting because it was like, you just have these random animals appearing behind my neck. But we have this tree here. It's not a, it's not a real tree, unfortunately. But it looks green. My downward spiral. So when you don't interact or fret over random thoughts, that would be considered intrusive. They're just simple scenarios in your head that aren't a huge deal. I've been practicing that. Mm, that sounds useful to practice. Lori says, I'm in a pretty toxic social environment where having a panic attack would expose me to ridicule and exclusion. Since my fear is panicking and being ridiculed, exposing myself to it would actually be useful for my health. Mm. Actually, Lori, I didn't totally fall. Since my fear is panicking and being ridiculed, exposing myself to it would actually... No, 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 no. This is... Uh, uh, so there is um, there is a story in the back of You Are Not a Rock or The Mind Workout about a kid who, yeah, he goes to the zoo and uh, he ends up exposing himself to the fear of being eaten by a tiger and the fear of being, you know, ridiculed by the other kids because the kids kind of peer pressure him into getting into the tiger uh, enclosure and uh, yeah, he gets eaten by the tiger. It, uh, yeah, is not useful to us. So you see that there is an environment there uh, which is not supportive. Um, and so, yeah, of course, there's a fears around having a panic attack um, and being ridiculed by others, which is understandable. Uh, but also, yeah, if you're not in a supportive environment, uh, there's, no, there's no payoff to us doing something that's just gonna be a painful experience. But the reason I put that story in the book and I bring it up and, and I, I talk about it often uh, is because our brains seem to love to put us in situations uh, to like, that are just heavy and create a lot of work and create more pain because then we'll do more compulsions around those and it'll just go on and on and on. So like I would step back always, and this is for everybody, because we've kind of talked about this a bunch tonight, today, this morning already. Take a step back from fixing fear, because if we're focused on fixing fear, then we do do things like uh, get in the tiger cage and be like, oh, well, I can't run away from the tiger because I must face my fear. No, no, you'll just get eaten by the tiger. We always start with values. What is it we want to create and grow? And what is the easiest, most useful, supportive path to going there? There's no need to push ourselves into lifting some heavy, heavy weights if those weights aren't directly connected to what we want to be growing and building. Uh, the brain seems to have an incredible capacity to push us into tiger cages. And be like, oh, you can't, 
you can't you can't get out of the cage. You have to face your fear. Uh, so yeah, just watch out for the brain doing stuff like that, because it loves to do more compulsions around more pain. Where do we want to go? What do we want to build? That's where we start. Oh, the black. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate you taking part in the space as well. Ah, uh, Shivadeep, yeah, you said, I've been struggling to stop myself from watching YouTube videos to recover from OCD, your videos included. Yeah, oh, it was really useful to put some kind of cap on like looking up mental health content and things like that. Same with books, the works. We can watch all of the content in the world. Everything that's been made, everything that will be made. It does not replace the actual actions that we need to take. And so, yeah, really recognizing, like, you've seen enough content. Uh, so now, what do you want to start choosing to do instead of just watching more content? Uh, and recognize when you step away from it, the brain is going to make you feel like you don't know. It's going to make you feel like there must be something missing. Or if you just went and found one more video, you, you would, we're going to share the special recipe for the soap that will scrub the mind. It's going to promise that. And you got to recognize it's lying. Saeed said, I'm having a hard time distinguishing between intrusive thoughts and thoughts I should listen to. Mm, for example, having a socially anxious thought. What if my mind is telling me to take a break? <laughs> I just saw my, yeah, what is it? Harm, Mark Freeman, yeah. Well, Said, so I don't differentiate, like I wouldn't see, uh, like I wouldn't distinguish between intrusive thoughts and thoughts you said I should listen to. Don't know, don't know what those look like or smell like or taste like. Uh, we have thoughts. So I use values to make decisions, so even around social stuff, being able to make decisions about how much social interaction I should make sure I'm getting, because I, I also might have a thought of like, oh, I don't, I don't need to you know, spend some time with people, or I'll just go do this thing alone, or something like that. Uh, I might, at the time, think that's a good idea. Uh, likewise, I might think I want to avoid some social interaction uh, as well, um, or that I might want to do more uh, it also helped me to see, uh, like one of the exercises I practice early on, um, cause I felt, I just had all these anxieties about like leaving a group early and somehow, oh, if I leave, uh, everybody's just going to talk about how glad they are I'm gone or they're going to, I don't know, have a really good time I'm not part of. And then I'll be not part of the group. Like I, so I would just, I would, just, I had to stay until the end of everything always. So it was really useful to start, uh, leaving early and i used values to set things like that like going and saying hey this is the time when i'm going to leave even if things are really enjoyable like i'm going to practice setting boundaries uh, but i was never able to rely on the wacky stuff up there and i still wouldn't uh, so yeah i wouldn't distinguish between thoughts there are thoughts some of them can be I don't know, nice and fluffy, and some are sharp and spiky. That's how they are. Uh, but values, especially with things like social stuff. Uh, I approach uh, social stuff like uh, w watering a garden. Uh, yeah, like we can't, we can't leave it up to, do I feel like the plants need more water? Uh, we've we've got to really understand like how much water they need to thrive and stick with it. Luke. Is it Luke or Luca? Luke A or Luca? So, so if it's that easy, oh, oh, I wonder what's the, okay, I'll start from the beginning. Hi, Mark. So if it's that easy, colon, have intrusive thoughts, don't react to them, sit through anxiety, then what role does a professional therapist play? Because unfortunately, I don't have access to therapy. The, so, one thing uh, to keep in mind is that 
there's been multiple research studies looking at, uh, like comparing self-help and people going to therapy. And they, sometimes therapy does better, sometimes self-help does better, sometimes they do the same, et cetera. So it's, it's kind of all over the place. But what we can see in multiple studies when we put them all together is that roughly, uh, if you're gonna do self-help or you're gonna do therapy, a large group of people will find it helpful to do either of those. This makes sense because mental health skills are, yeah, separate from a person. Like, we kind of have this weird idea when we think about mental health help and treatment. I also see it all the time. People send me a message, say, oh, you've got to help me. There's not a special thing that I can do to that person. And if you go uh, to any kind of mental health treatment, there's not a thing that they're going to do to you. Uh, mental health is much more like physical fitness. So also thinking about physical fitness, yeah, you could say, well, why do I need to go to a personal trainer? I mean, I'll just lift the weights or like run until I feel like stopping and then run a little bit further. And yeah, like the, the principles aren't, aren't in the trainer, they're not in the therapist. Anybody can access the principles and practice them and learn them and build on them, collaborate with other people, share experiences, continue learning, read books, but apply it, watch videos, but make sure you apply it in real action. Uh, and so even the focus of the work I do is, is to look at how can I make resources that make it easier for people to access those skills because many people cannot access a professional. It should be available for anybody who wants to, to access the tools to take care of their mental health and improve it. The reason many people will find it useful to work with a professional, whether it's mental fitness or physical fitness, is because they'll put together, ideally, uh, exercises uh, that you may not have thought of yourself. And, they'll be able to help you overcome common challenges where uh, you might come up with a bunch of reasons uh, that sound good in your head to do a bunch of compulsions and it can be useful to have somebody to point out that those compulsions are a very bad idea. Um, and But yeah, they've seen lots of people come up with those same rational reasons to do compulsions before. Uh, so yeah, really, recognize you can access all of these tools now and yeah there's a lot of research backing up that you can take these tools and apply them and see the same results as somebody that may learn those tools in therapy when somebody asks uh hey can i do this on my own or do i have to see a therapist uh yeah one thing i always ask people to consider is how much experience you have making changes in your life uh the the changes involved with recovery are a lot like making other changes we might have made. Like, for instance, with physical fitness, like if somebody has experience, for instance, like training for some kind of uh, sport or like a big event, like a marathon or something. Uh, yeah, marathon is a great example. So if they've gone through a marathon training schedule on their own, then you see like, that person knows how to, you know, make some changes and set some boundaries in their lives for doing something that's unusual and different. Uh, it's going to be the same set of skills they can apply to the changes they're going to make with mental health. If they have not had that experience of bringing some kind of change into their life or learning some kind of skill, uh, then they might really benefit from working with somebody at the start. August said hello from Norway. Hello to Norway. Quick question. Is it okay to enjoy the relief I get when I automatically reassure myself? Or should I not put value to that feeling as well? Oh, August, and thank you for the kind words as well. Uh, yeah, I would, the question about automatic reassurance comes up often. Uh, yeah, and seeing, yeah, if we automatically reassure ourselves or not, or whatever, yeah, being able to say, ah, oh, okay, that happened, but I'm gonna go and give my time and energy to these things that I care about. Uh, so all sorts of things. 
like that can happen very automatically. And yet it's more about us just starting to show the brain that yeah, it can do whatever it wants. If it wants to do that, fine, do it. Same with if it was throwing up something terrible and we're like, oh, you gotta stop doing that. That shouldn't be here at this time. It's just like some kind of offensive, intrusive thought when we're having an important conversation. The brain can do that. If the brain wants to throw out some reassurance sometimes, ah, it can do that too. It can do whatever it wants. And we're gonna go do what we want. Quinn. Yeah, he said, I noticed that, so this is on the meditation question from earlier. He said, I noticed that a lot of people use meditation to become rocks, not feel anything. A band-aid solution. I love your book, by the way. Oh, thanks for reading. And some say the purpose is to free yourself from your ego and accept that you have no free will. Oh, wow, I've never, I did not know that. Oh, and then he said, I'm literally so hyped. I finally caught one of these live streams. Thanks for joining the live stream. So on meditation, so I practice in the Zen uh, tradition, specifically in the Soto Zen uh, tradition. And I, so I wouldn't see the point of meditation to be either of those things you mentioned. It's definitely not to become a rock. I mean, it's, it's going to feel all of the things. Uh, but I also wouldn't see it as, uh, especially, ex like, definitely not about accepting anything to do with free will. Um, freeing yourself from your ego. The, so, in, I mean, it, and really in, in many Zen traditions, the argument would be that you can't do that. You can simply be aware of it. Um, so I always watch out for any kind of what's called a gaining idea. Like I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to gain something, uh, some special awareness or some extra level of humanness or something like that. Uh, so yeah, if you're starting to explore meditation, I would actually really watch out, especially for any teacher that promises you uh, if you do this thing, you're going to gain some, some special, uh, special release or freedom. That would immediately send up big red flags uh, for me if I heard a, a meditation teacher talking like that. Uh, we can sit and be present. There is nothing more to get beyond the present moment. Luna said, any tips navigating coming home from a long holiday? Brain is throwing up lots of problems to be solved now I'm home, but things felt so easy while I was away. Yes, so I always point out to, to everybody, so as many of you will know, I do some traveling. Uh, and the question of what to do when we come back from a long trip, people raise it a lot. Uh, so the first thing I always ask is, why did the trip end? Because clearly an easy solution here is to not, not come back from the long trip. So that's one. Now, sometimes that's not possible. If we absolutely must return, Something I always suggest to people is to have a ramp down. We are making a change in like we were living in one way on the trip um, and suddenly we're shifting back into a different kind of format or schedule. And it's very useful to ease ourselves into it. The brain could be in a bunch of different uh, states, depending on what's going on. Uh, for instance, it may be the case that the trip was very busy. There was lots of new things. And suddenly coming back, there are no new things. Uh, there's nothing to occupy it. And so it's going to create some stuff to fill the space. Because maybe it's coming back and like it's just going back to an old routine. It's kind of not as exhilarating or as exciting as the trip was. Brain's going to try to fill the space. So that ramp down when we come back might be like having some new stuff even when we're back into the old schedule to just kind of ease the brain back down.
from the extreme newness of the trip. But likewise, the trip could also be uh, very quiet, calm, maybe very peaceful. And then what I'll often see happening is that the brain, actually the whole trip, the brain's like, ah, this is weird. You got to give me something to control. You got to give me something to control. Ah, we have nothing. And then you come back and sometimes people will notice it's like their, their brain just locks down hard on everything. Finally, the brain's like, yes, things to control and think about and fix and solve. Oh, I've been waiting for this. And it just goes. And even we might have cut out a bunch of compulsions just because we were away on the trip. And suddenly people will notice when they come back, brain is like, oh, I want to do all of the compulsions. And it just goes hard because uh, there's stuff to do again. Uh, so likewise, really important to look at that ramp down and just being cognizant of, hey, we're making this shift. Say, for instance, I was in a state where I didn't have to do a lot of compulsions and stuff like that. How do I help myself continue that? Because if I just go straight back to normal, the brain is going to just bite down hard on all those old compulsions. Yeah, so I hope, I know you're already back, but I hope you can give yourself a little bit of ramp now that you're back. Yes, bagel, bagel, bagel. Thank you for stopping by and shared a, a useful point there about meditation. Bagel, bagel, bagel said one of the purposes of meditating is just sitting. That is the kind I practice, just sitting in the purpose. Exactly. It is useful to sit and stop and there's nothing else we have to do. I am, oh, I see. I'm, I'm rolling behind. But I just want to say, Martina, thank you so much for the donation. I appreciate it. Thank you for stopping by this weekend. I hope your weekend is going well. Pom Pom Kitty he said, so I've been taking good care of myself and I take myself out on solo dates. That sounds nice. I give myself compassion and I'm kind to myself. I feel... I finally feel complete by myself now, and I don't feel the need for someone to complete me. But still, sometimes I feel lonely and depressed. A feeling of having someone to share things with often creeps in. I wonder if I'm not loving myself enough. How do I feel with this empty feeling of loneliness? Well, the, one of the things to consider is, is the goal here to like, clean away that feeling? Can it be that that feeling can be kind of nice right in that feeling you see a desire to care uh, for others to be with others to share things with others and even so thinking about if you know you're a good friend of yourself uh, that you're taking on dates and spending time with uh, if that good friend of yours said like ah, oh, like I feel kind of lonely today would you tell them like, ah, uh, we got to get rid of that feeling. Does it mean something about me? We're spending time together. Why are you lonely? You shouldn't be lonely. Uh, no, like that friend can be lonely. And how do you want to treat them? What do you want to share with them? Uh, yeah, we can have these feelings. Caring for ourselves, being kind to ourselves can also include being kind to ourselves when we notice things that we might be missing or things we'd like to have. It's okay to notice that. Yeah. I hope you have a lot of fun dates with yourself too. Vegan Knowledge said, I didn't have any of this in 2020. And there are compulsions I have now that since then have like gotten me where I don't even really want to leave the house. Have you heard of this happening to anyone at 44 years old? Mm. So Vegan Knowledge, what you're describing there sounds just totally normal. Uh, and so I'm curious, so like the checking, if somebody had experienced it at a particular age, that suggests to me, like the, it's things like that that are the compulsions. There's nothing, so also it could be useful to look at like what you're attaching meaning to, because there was nothing in what you described that jumps out as in any way unusual. But if you're judging it as unusual in some way, then it makes sense that you then would want to get reassurance about it. But it can really help to look at those judgments that I like to call it differencing. So differencing is really common uh, when we're struggling with stuff where we'll go, oh, this is different. This means something. I've got to check on this. Uh, but it's just, yeah, really normal stuff. Tona, thanks for joining us. 
I said, my brain is obsessed with past relationships where I was discarded, even though those are uh, way ago over. Have a good day. Yeah, Tony, you know what I like to look at there is just that younger self who's like hurting. And yeah, like they can be a long time ago and that self goes, ah, but this hurt. And us, like there's not a thing we have to do to clean it, but just giving him a hug. Yeah, being like, yeah, that hurt. That hurt. And that's okay. And you're here to take care of him now. Quinn. Yeah, he said, is religion and recovery compatible? I have less anxiety now that I stopped trying to be a Christian so bad. Accepting there's probably nothing after death actually makes me feel better. I guess I'm agnostic. Yeah, uh, I actually um, find that uh, religion, if somebody has a religious practice, it's often really helpful uh, when we're working on recovery skills because uh, religions, religions you could look at many ways as a, a traditional shared set of values. And I have yet to discover a religion on our planet, not ruling out other planets, uh, on our planet that doesn't have a lot of great messages about handling uncertainty. Um, and you could look at religion um, as an evolutionary tool to handle uncertainty in complex large groups as we created complex large groups. Yeah, so I, so I find uh, yeah, recovery consistently very compatible uh, with people's religious practice. I've worked with uh, people in many different religions and, and it's a, a big, uh, it's always consistently been a big support. Likewise, people can do lots of compulsions around uh, religion as well. But I find, yeah, having a consistent practice, because I would, again, say every religion has a lot of great messages around practice as opposed to like ruminating uh, excessively on stuff. Tona, yeah, you said, after stopping binge drinking for years and years, I see my brain throwing lots of past memories about things I regret and make me feel guilt. Ah, uh, any thoughts on this? Yeah, so yeah, continuing on what we were just talking about there. Yeah, it's a lot of times just noticing that and just seeing that self, right? Throwing it up like, ah, do you remember this? This hurt. And being like, yeah, that hurt. And now we're here. Sarabja, he said, my OCD got worse during COVID. My greatest accomplishment in 2023 was to finally start my career in law. Well, congratulations, Sarabja. Mm. But then he said, so which I'd been avoiding due to compulsions, but yet nothing seems to feel right. I've been doing compulsions for so long that I don't even recall what my life used to be before OCD took over. I don't love compulsions, but imagining a life free of compulsions seems so scary. Yeah. The irony is that scary thoughts are the root cause of my compulsions. What's the way forward? Ah, so, Sarabja, I would say, uh, is there confusion about the way forward? You, see, you seem to present two things. One, living your life, and two, scary thoughts and compulsions. And so uh, I, would, I, would pick, I would pick the, the first one, the living your life one. Tona, yeah, he said, uh, why if everybody has difficult thoughts and feelings, not everyone does compulsions around those experiences, and why uh, do others? Well, so I, I would say everybody does. Uh, I, it's, there are many compulsions that will be seen as socially acceptable, but it's very rare. I mean, you know, a phone is a great example. I mean, if, if you think people don't do compulsions, just go in a, a room full of people and ask, uh, ask everybody to put their phone in a box and tell them they can't have their phone for two hours. See, see how well they handle that. It's pr pretty standard that people, if they haven't built the skills not to, will really struggle uh, with urges, difficult feelings, 
etc. Uh, they may not impair their life. It may be very easy for them to just avoid something that makes them anxious, and it just never be an issue because they'll just, you know, say for instance, oh, I, this thing makes me anxious, so I just don't do it. I cut it out, and so they, they'll never be anxious or distressed by it. But they'll also have just cut off a part of their lives. So there's that. As well, uh, we learn how to handle uncomfortable experiences uh, from when we're young. So a lot of people may learn really unhelpful ways to interact with difficult experiences. And those will be evident. Uh, whereas, yeah, some people will have learned uh, more useful ways to interact with difficult experiences. Erica, welcome. It's good to see you, Erica. He said, sometimes after hanging out with a group, I feel awful. Oh, and I think I was horrible. No fun. No one likes me. They didn't enjoy the food I made. Oh, what is happening here? And what can I do differently? So I find one of the things with this is to expect it. So when uh, you're going to some kind of social event or something like that, expect the brain to do something like that after. Uh, so I find part of it is just expecting it. Like we start to see, oh, I get it, brain. This is a thing you do afterwards. Um, yeah, like there are a bunch of different reasons. Some is why stuff like that comes up. I mean, one that I see a lot is just that our brain seems to like kind of pointing out or creating a problem precisely because we'll fix it. And we'll get that hit of reassurance if, uh, like, it'll be like, oh, nobody liked your food. But then if we can go, oh, but they, you know, they ate it all and they said they liked it. And, oh, like, this friend said they'd want to be buried in a bowl of my hummus. And, like, and you're like, oh, okay, okay, maybe it was good. And then we're like, oh, yeah, it was good. And, oh, like, I'm going to message somebody and just be like, oh, hey, I hope, I hope you liked my hummus and like, wait. And then, oh, they'll be like, they sent me so many emojis back. Oh, okay, they must have liked it. Uh, that the brain is setting up this bad thing, so we'll fix it, is one of the common things that happens. Uh, it also just helped me to see, like my brain and its judgment machinery just loves to hate on stuff. Uh, and so it, there was many different areas where this would come up. Uh, something would happen and I just had to expect, okay, I'm gonna leave. And my brain's going to list out all the things that are wrong with that or that person and just allowing it to do that. That's a thing it does. Congratulations, brain. This is also one of the reasons why with social settings and like when we talked about like Sesame Street goals and stuff like that before, uh, having that goal set before the social event. So when the brain goes after stuff like that, we can also say, like if it's like, oh, nobody likes you. You're like, all right, well, I, I, my goal is not to get people to like me. Uh, and we can touch that feeling. Okay, brain, nobody's ever going to talk to me again. Uh, but my only goal there was to bring a bowl of hummus. Did I bring a bowl of hummus? I brought a bowl of hummus. Okay, I was successful uh, since that was the last time I'll ever hang out with any people ever. I'm glad I could share that hummus with them. From now on, I will only eat hummus home alone. But I'm glad I got to share it with those people this evening. And leaving it at that, so letting the brain do its thing, we can play with the kind of the fear there underneath that. Um, but yeah, sometimes it might just be like, that's a, a thing it does, uh, kind of like getting the indigestion. Like, oh, when my brain processes a group of people, it, uh, it's always gonna get a little bit of uh, kind of acid reflux, where it's gonna try to like burn something. Uh, they can do that. Chris Lays, the math dragon. So any tips for someone who has way too much stuff they want to do and feels guilty for not being able to do it all? I grew up around the hustle culture that you speak of. Uh, wondering your thoughts. Yeah, priorities. Uh, even kind of like what we were just talking about there uh, with the hummus. Uh, and so like picking simple priorities and dropping the other things. Because yeah, your brain's always going to go, ah, you did one thing, we should have done 10 things. But being able to identify that one thing and really say, hey, I'm going to choose this one thing and I'm going to drop the other stuff. Yeah, I'm not going to do everything. I really just want to do this. 
practicing that consistently feels dangerous and wild at first, like an extreme sport. But it's really enjoyable. The irony is when we give our attention to simple things, uh, we tend to go much further than we would have trying to do 50 million things. Michael said, I'm struggling with how to be led by values in dating rather than exclusively feelings. I'm concerned I'm dating people I don't feel strongly enough about. How do you navigate this? There's a couple things to look at. And so one of the things to look at too uh, are any past experiences you've had with dating uh, and strong feelings and whether those relationships worked out the way you wanted them to. So that's an element, you know, if you're working with a therapist or something like that, talking to them about kind of the journey of relationships. Uh, yeah, what you've seen, experienced, so there's probably some data there. When we're looking at values in a relationship, a lot of it is about what we want to create and build. That becomes especially important in a relationship that we want to sustain, right? If the goal is to sustain a relationship, there's going to be all sorts of ups and downs where like we'll feel all sorts of bad things and sometimes we'll feel good things and then some bad things and good things, etc. So we can't just look at those up and down feeling points because if every time we're down, we end the relationship. Uh, but then when it's up, uh, or we start to feel up, we're like, oh, I got to get back together, etc. That can be pretty chaotic. So what are those data points, those values, those actions in your life that are going to carry you through? Where you'll be able to look and say, I know my brain and my feelings can be all over the place. How will I know? that this is a relationship I want to continue building and growing. Uh, so I'd be really curious about exploring those data points, but then also, yeah, looking at past relationships and anything we can learn uh, from the data from those. Bora, uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for letting me know my shirt is sick. He said, how do you differentiate between an obsession and values? Since you can definitely say some personal obsessions are your value. Mm, I don't understand uh, the overlap there. Uh, maybe one way to think of it is values are going to be, like make values actions. Actions uh, that you grow. Uh, so I'd start there. Emperor 3000, he said, I've done LSD, shrooms, and DMT several times each. I feel normal, but is it possible that I've messed my brain chemistry forever? Do you suggest me to remain 100% sober? Uh, so checking on whether you've messed up your brain chemistry forever is a really common reassurance checking uh, question. We fear like people will do it around all sorts of things. Like, did I get a chemical... Uh, are there some things in my food that have messed me up forever? Did I touch something? Did I do something 10 years ago that's in my body now and it's going to cause all sorts of problems in the future, etc.? So I'm not going to be able to give you a reassurance on that. What I would look at instead is just like, yeah, what, what do you want to support yourself in doing in life? Uh, yeah, how would it be useful to support yourself? Khaled said, uh, oh, I appreciate it. You're welcome. He said, I watched a lot of videos to help me with OCD, but with not much effect. But once I watched your videos, it was like, boom, clarity hit me. And now I feel much more better and confident. I'm glad they've been useful. Enjoy taking the videos and turning them into action. Ugbad said, it's been a long time. Oh, how long has it been? And then he said, when I hear people say some words related to mental health, I get really scared. It's okay to be scared. Mud said, I think for me, with so many compulsions being around social attachment things, the benefit of therapy comes in the relationship and the practice and experimentation allows. Yeah, it, 
it is a really key uh, point. Thanks for bringing that up, Mike. Yeah, it's it's also one of those things like a, a relation, like a relationship with a mental health professional can be a way to practice the social interaction um, and relationship building. Uh, yeah, that like the and even I would say in general, one of the benefits is that you're getting with together with somebody and the, the meeting should be a model of the skills that you're talking about and going to apply. Um, and so in that way, it can be really uh, beneficial to have that opportunity to model, to practice um, the skills. 11 tree lover 11. Yeah, he said, what are your opinions on medication? Maybe you can't answer that. Uh, but just wondering, yeah, like I always uh, mention the same thing with this. Uh, my focus is on the changes we make and the skills we make, whether somebody takes medication or doesn't take medication. Uh, we still got to learn how to interact uh, differently with experiences. Bagel, bagel, bagel. He said, I have therapy one time a week and an autistic peer support, someone my age, and there's something useful about two people showing up for a common mission of building the things I want in my life. Yeah, exactly. And he said, I wanted to quit because it moves slowly, but that's the point. It's a study, so nine more months. It keeps me curious and gives a chance to go. I spent a long time ruminating on X. Let's move on. Yeah, that's a great point. Thanks for sharing that, bagel, bagel, bagel. Yeah, enjoy... Uh, Enjoy the rest of the nine more months. Arya, happy new year to you. Thank you. Emil, yeah, you said any tips for long distance relationship anxiety. See, I don't have any tips for the anxiety. I'd be curious about what you want to build in the relationship long term. So like the tip I would share is, yeah, what's what does a good long distance relationship look like for you? And what are the actions that are gonna support that? And I would have that discussion together. So as a couple, so you have a shared understanding of what's it look like to do this well? What are the things we don't know, but we want to explore? Uh, and then what are those actions we're gonna to do together? Bora. He said, how do you know when you're going down the wrong way? I mean this in terms of obsessions, values, people, whatever action we may do, how do we have the vision to see that it's taking us to a place we don't want to go? And so again, because we think about that metaphor of being out in the wilderness. So we're out wandering around. We've never been through the wilderness of life before. This is our first time. So yeah, we're going to wander places. And then we got to be able to look and see, is this a place I, I want to be in the forest, or is there a, another place? And so some of it is just picking some criteria so that we can look and say, oh, can I grow and build the things I want to grow and build here? Uh, and so I would look at the growing in the building. What do you want to create? What do you want to give? Because then we can look at the terrain around us. So if I thought, I was like, oh, I want to go that direction. That looks really interesting. And I went that direction in the forest, but now I'm in a swamp. And like, actually, I was looking for a good place to set up a cabin. And I'm like, oh, this is, you know, the water comes down the hills here and it probably it floods. I can see some evidence of that. This is not a good place to build a cabin. So I might say, oh, okay, there's some kind of hills and higher ground over there. Maybe that would be better. I'm going to go over there now. But somebody else, say they're a professor of like biology. Um, and so they're looking for some, some rare species of plants or salamanders or something like that. They may arrive in the swamp and go, wow, oh, look at all these interesting species of plants. And sal I'm gonna be able to write so many research papers here. This is, I'm, this is gonna be a place I return to. I can build so much of my career on what I'm gonna discover here. So for them, that swamp is a great place. We only know it's a great place if we've identified some things we want to build. And so, yeah, that's what I'd look at. And yeah, we don't even know if those are the right things to build. 
I don't know if they'll be permanent. I may decide, oh, I want to go up that hill and I'm going to build a log cabin. But then, yeah, there could be a forest fire next year and I'll burn it down. That's possible. And I'll find another place to build the log cabin and build it there. Or decide, whoa, log cabins are a lot of upkeep. I'm just going to keep on hiking. That's possible too. So also allowing ourselves that freedom to try things. We'll try things and we'll see how they work. Arya said, I've cut out so many compulsions. I only have fleeting thoughts for a few seconds nowadays and I'm able to reshift my focus super quick. Thank you for all your tips. Oh, Arya, congratulations on applying these skills. Quinn. Oh, thanks for the kind words. <laughs> he said, I don't even like reading, but I read your book in a couple of days. I hope I can catch another stream soon. Well, thanks for stopping by this stream. I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. He said, I am, however, still afraid of traveling and being on my own, fearing severe panic attacks. I also have a trip coming up. Any tips? Uh, so I have a whole section uh, or a whole blog and a section on the blog uh, devoted to travel mental health. So it's called the mindfulfieldguide.com. So if you go to the mindfulfieldguide.com, mindful uh, yeah, and just there's a travel mental health section. You'll see it at the top of the website there. There's a whole bunch of tips on there, especially there's specifically tips on uh, the fear of panic attacks on trips. As well, there's a video on my YouTube channel if you're going to be flying, uh, and it is on how to give yourself panic attacks on the plane uh, if you want to make sure you have one. Uh, so I'd check that out as well. Yeah, Dark Sniper said, any tips for not chasing feelings in a relationship and letting them come on their own? So already having that perspective or approach that you're mentioning there, I find it is a huge part of it, just that we're open to that possibility. We know we might have that tendency to grab for something and get something. Being able to allow it to happen and kind of catch it. So I'll describe it as catching a bubble. So we're not gonna like try and grab it because then we pop the bubble. We're also not just gonna be totally aloof and be like, I don't care because then the bubble falls on the ground and it pops too. We wanna just gently catch it in our hands. So yeah, just starting to have that perspective and approach is really useful. I would look at what are some things I want to give to the relationship. The reason for that is that then we can understand that we're caring for the relationship. It's a lot like caring for a garden. We don't know what the garden is going to produce. But what I can do is identify some actions to care for that garden. And I might be, oh, there's so much uncertainty. I don't know what's going to happen here. Yeah, but am I taking care of it in a way that I know is useful to it? I am. Okay. Then I celebrate that and I let the garden do its growing. And I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to enjoy the process of caring for it. And I'm going to enjoy it when it flourishes. So yeah. Have fun exploring just how you want to take care of that garden. Erica, you said, it's so funny you mentioned hummus. I brought a roasted garlic rosemary white bean dip to the party. Yes. And people kept asking, oh no, what kind of hummus is this? <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. Like any kind of bean, uh, yeah, like pulverized bean deliciousness with like that sounds amazing too like roasted garlic and rosemary sounds so good and yeah i can see why people would just assume any any kind of bean pulverized bean uh dip is uh, hummus but to even think i what is the translation of hummus i wonder what hummus um because i wonder kind of like um uh, i'm thinking of uh like a mole, like is it just like a sauce? Um, I wonder if I wonder if hummus is like just the word for like dip 
or something like that. So it's like a white bean dip is also a hummus. Maybe, I don't know. Rostam he said, tips on planning the day without ruminating and getting stuck in the brain. My brain always gives me 74,484 options of things to do and reasons to do something and reasons not to, and it just floods me. I know 74,484 is like a medium number of things to do. It's not a small number. One thing that can really help is to, especially in the morning, is to have identified something the night before. So I used to do this. This helped in a couple ways because I also noticed I used to be thinking about all the things I had to do. But I, I didn't put them anywhere or have them anywhere. So I had to keep them in my head. And it kind of seemed like my brain liked that. Like, oh, we're gonna, I got to keep, remember this. Don't, don't forget this. We got this. Oh, what about this? Like it liked constantly trying to like keep everything and worrying about forgetting things. So I realized that wasn't useful to me. Because also I would go to bed just thinking about all the things I would have to do tomorrow. And then of course, yeah, I'd wake up and I'd be like, oh, what do I got to do? There's all these things. It really helped to identify the night before. And I would put it in my calendar. Like, here's what I'm going to do uh, in the morning. And then when I would notice that urge to like, think about it, let me go, oh, I'm, not, I'm not doing anything with that. I don't even know what I'm doing tomorrow morning, but I know in that calendar over there, it tells me what I'm gonna do. I'm not gonna think about it anymore. And actually kind of sitting in that uncertainty of like, oh, I don't, I, I don't know what I'm gonna do. The magic calendar is my boss and it will tell me what I'm gonna do, uh, was really useful. So starting to find ways to show the brain we don't have to think about the 74,484 things. And we're not going to take part in that. When I would uh, wake up in the morning, another thing I used, and this was more that, so that I wouldn't use my phone, but it might be relevant here too. Uh, when I was cutting out using my phone in the morning, I would put a sticky note on the phone with a task because uh, I used my phone as my alarm. Uh, so I would, ha I would have had to take the sticky note off to use the screen. Uh, so the sticky note would tell me to go and do something. Um, and so that could also be a way you could, uh, you could identify something the night before. Regardless of the options the brain throws up in the morning, you're doing the task on the sticky note. Sarah said, I had to move last week. Really homesick and felt super anxious and trapped at this new place last night. Oh, when we move into a new place. Uh, so I, I move into new places a lot. Uh, one of the things that has become really important is when moving into a new place to immediately uh, make it a home. So being very conscious of what are the things that, are, that I you know support me in a place and also how can I really see it as a, a home. Like this is a place where I'm going to be and approaching each place like that. Uh, and so yeah, you might find it similarly useful to develop uh, kind of practice of being at home. Uh, so yeah, what are the supports that make it a home for you? Uh, how do you, and I, I approach it like I kind of have to walk my brain around like it's a dog and, and like show it its territory. Uh, and so yeah, I'm very conscious when I go to a new place like that I'm making it a home. Uh, and so yeah, I hope, I hope you can make your new place a home as well. Deb, thank you so much for the donation and the, uh, the bowing character. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining uh, this weekend and supporting uh, the live stream. I appreciate it a lot. Vegan knowledge. He said, I wonder if there's a connection with a person's level of creativity and OCD the things my mind comes up with to cause me compulsions. I feel my own creativity is working against me in a sense. I can hear you in my mind saying, I'll stop worrying about why and stop the compulsions. Yeah, because uh, the thing is we could come up with so many things like that. Uh, but yeah, you could just as easily come up with arguments that OCD is uh, like the lack of creativity. Uh, like we see us 
like repeating the same thing over and over again rather than doing something different. Uh, yeah, like the, it, it, it'll just, it can think of anything to trap uh, us in an endless argument if we engage in the argument. Keep in mind, it is just that random guy shouting on the street. If we stop to debate with him, the debate continues. Uh, and yeah, sometimes he'll throw out stuff. We'll be like, ah, hey, because you'll see us walking away and he'll be like, oh, I can tell you're one of the creative ones. I want to talk to somebody who's actually creative, not all these other people. You, you are uniquely creative. And we're like, me? Me? You think I am creative? Oh, thank you. And then we go and talk to him and then he's, and then he's hooked us. Uh, so yeah, just watch out. The, he'll say anything. He'll say terrible things about us to get us into a debate. He'll say really nice things about us to get us into a debate. We got to just go and walk on past him. Erica says, I threw everyone for a loop by bringing non-hummus to a party. <laughs> he said, thanks for the tips. Uh, I'll get back in the habit of expecting my brain to do what it does after a social event. Yeah, have fun taking uh, non-hummus hummus. hummus. Uh, two parties and the brain. Marlos Morale, thanks for dropping by. Sarah, oh, also you said I turned 40 today. Well, congratulations. I said, does mental health just get worse as we age if we don't take serious action to change it? Uh, mental health, so I wouldn't look at it as an aging thing. I always look at it more as a practice thing. Uh, and even seeing it, you know, not as a, a thing that in a sense gets worse, but that we're just, we're practicing more. In a sense, we get better. If we keep practicing compulsions, we get better and better and more automatic at them. When we're cutting them out, you could think of it as getting bad at a sport. So there's a sport we've played for years and years and years, or a musical instrument we've played. So we've played the tuba for 40 years. We get pretty good at the tuba. But now we want to play the clarinet. We can play the clarinet, but we're going to have to stop playing the tuba. And that's hard because we're going to be bad at the clarinet, sort of, at first, and we'll still be good at the tuba. It'd be so hard to, you know, pick up the clarinet and not, like, grab the tuba. Uh, but it's very doable. Mm -hmm. Happy birthday. Oh, I see, yes, we have some happy birthday messages and emojis in the chat. Thanks, everybody, for celebrating Sarah's birthday. Srabja, so yeah, I said there are a bunch of books and videos on the law of attraction, effects, which implies that what you think constantly is you attract in real life, which kind of fuels my magical thinking, OCD. But it is. Everything you described there is magical thinking. Uh, the law of attraction is just... And this goes back to... I mean, uh, people were asking earlier about um, compulsions. Like why do some people have compulsions, other people not? But like things like law of attraction, yeah, you can see um, those communities. Like what would just be magical thinking if you phrased it a little differently? Like if you didn't just say um, it was this, you know, law of attraction. Uh, you just said, oh, I believe that I can control the universe by doing the following. Um, yeah, it would just be classic uh, magical thinking compulsions. Jordan's are welcome. I hope you're well too. Michael said, I hope you are well. Lately, my thoughts have shifted back to my family's religion, Christianity, considering adopting it. My brain also tells me this is not me, and it's just another compulsion to chase security through salvation. Intense dissonance is occurring. Why would my brain bring it up just to tell me I'm wrong? Oh, but you see it. The brain... The brain just loves to do the compulsions. Um, there's so many examples, actually, uh, where what you described happens. One of the places uh, our brains will do this a lot uh, is with social stuff. Brain will be like, oh, we're so lonely. We have to be with somebody. Uh, oh, like, why aren't we with somebody? Oh, we got to get people to like us. And then we'll go be with people and the brain the whole time will be like, oh, I don't like that person. That person, oh, that's not a kind of person we would like to be with. Oh, I don't feel connection, et cetera, et cetera. We'd be like, fine, I'm, I'm out of here. I don't connect with anybody. And the brain will stick people between this, like, you must meet people and you connect with nobody. The brain just loves it because it just keeps it going. 
and then we'll just constantly we'll be like hating on things and then we'll be hating on other people and then hating on being alone and it goes and goes and goes same with uh doing the things we want to do we will do compulsions to prevent missing out on life we're like oh, i've got to do this thing because i've got to make sure the things i care about because we really care about doing the things we care about but then if we're given the option to go and do the things we care about, we'll come up with all sorts of reasons why we can't do them. Which only makes us more afraid of missing out on life. So we, then we do more of the compulsions to make sure we don't miss out on life. And it just, the cycle just goes and goes and goes. Uh, so yeah, really, really common. Really helpful to break this cycle. Everybody, this comes up regardless of your fears. We really have to notice that cycle. The brain will get us trapped in. And just break it by living our lives. Blooper said, how do I stop wanting something? I want to move to another country. And I'm ruminating on not being able to all the time. Like I want to work towards it, but not ruminate 24-7 about not being able to. Yeah, so setting, so I call this like the never-ending strategy meeting. Like you imagine if you were in a company and you want to get some work done, but there's this one person who always keeps dropping by your cubicle and they're like, hey, Hey, I know we had that strategy meeting, but hey, can we just talk about the product strategy for next year again? And we're like, okay. And then, but then the next day they do it, and the next day, and the next day. And they want to spend so much time having the business strategy meeting that you have no time to actually do the business. And so we don't want to do that in our heads. Because that's what we're doing if we just like think about it constantly. Here, hey, this is what we could do in the future. Okay, let's think about that. We need to be here and present so what you can do is actually set a time to work on stuff like that and so you might do it like once a month or something like that like if it's something that requires some amount of time and energy for changes and paperwork or something like that to work towards that say look once a month i am going to set aside some time maybe on a saturday morning or something like that that whole saturday morning is actual doing things to plan working in another country. And I'm going to research things, I'm going to take action, I'm going to apply to things, I'm going to email people, but I'm going to do it all in that morning. If anything comes up outside of that, I'm going to have a place, like maybe in my email or something, a document somewhere, a book, notebook, I'm going to write down any other idea, but I'm not going to think about it. I'm going to save it for the next month's strategy meeting. And so actually putting it into a strategy meeting where you take action, you get way more done than just constantly trying to have this ongoing meeting that is not tied to action. So yeah, enjoy. Uh, if you end up working, uh, going on some adventures in other countries, yeah, I hope you have an easy time with it. Uh, Marlos uh, had a dream about me last night. He said, I just remembered I dreamt about Mark last night, he was in a monk's outfit filming a video about mental health. I believe there was some dancing, probably, but I don't remember. That's good to know. What, uh, most, do you remember what color uh, were the robes? The monk's robes. <laughs> Stefan, welcome. Said, uh, we need to redo the saying, actions speak louder than words. To actions speak louder than thoughts, 100%. All those thoughts are doing nothing. Ugbed, he said, how to stop feeling betrayed when people don't tell you about their own things? I always feel betrayed by this. Ugbed, I look at, yeah, like why, why do you believe people should tell you that? Or what do you believe it means that, uh, that they're not? As in like, why are you, are you betrayed? Because um, yeah, we, if we pick a goal, that involves controlling other people, then we're often going to be upset because uh, we don't control other people. Mm, yeah, Stefan, that's a great point. Yeah, he said, sounds like a contamination sort of thing. I can't live my life unless I accept and move on. Yeah. That pattern comes up so often, right? The brain loves it. Joy Pente. He said, is there any truth to the idea that doing compulsions on a small scale kind of opens the floodgates? Oh, yeah, I, I've noticed that massively. He said, I've noticed that it almost greases the door to let more grandiose compulsions. Oh, I love, I love that you use the word grandiose. 100%. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, it, it's so noticeable. For me, I always describe it as like it gets the machine going. It's yeah, one hundred percent. And it's something that I say people really need to watch out for because sometimes you're maybe you're put into doing some compulsions. Like even somebody earlier was talking about a trip. Uh, and so I was explaining, like, when we come back, we kind of need to ramp down. And so one of the reasons for that might be, say somebody had a trip that involved, like, say they were going around Europe and they had planned in all these really tight train connections. So just on the trip, they were constantly, oh, what time is it? Okay, we got to make sure we got to be at this place at this time. We got to get the train or oh, get checking train timetables. There was because of the structure of the trip. They were constantly having to check things to avoid a bad thing, like missing the train, not getting to the next place, messing up the trip. They had this complex thing. They were checking to make sure it went well. I would expect that when that person came back, the brain is going to be so, like you're saying, like greased up. The machine's going to be running because it's like, oh, we're so good at checking things to prevent bad things from happening. Oh, and now we have no trains to check. I can think of more things we can check and the brain will just start throwing them up because it just, it gets in that habit and then it just wants to check more. Uh, so yeah, really useful to notice. That's also why it's helpful to look past the topic. The topic of the theme is irrelevant. It's just the thing we were doing the compulsions around. So once we start doing the compulsions around one thing, the brain is going to things to do compulsions around because the topic is irrelevant. It's just looking to do more. And like any compulsion, that's just going to grow to grandiose, massive levels. Look at that. Is it how to stop procrastination? So a really fun exercise that uh, everybody can try this out if you've ever... Uh, yeah, even if you're not necessarily working on procrastination, but you, you just want to work on making changes, starting to get the brain to follow you. Uh, one of the things you can do is for a week, in your calendar, pick a random time. And so pick like a wrong time, like a 3.37 or something. So not, not like on the top of the hour or the half hour or something like that, this kind of random time. And set a really simple action to do, like walk outside, touch the tree at the end of the street and walk back. Just to practice showing the brain that you can choose to do something and whatever feelings, whatever thoughts are there, whatever amazing reason the brain has why now is not the best time to go and touch a tree, you have something more important to do, go and do it. And we do this, so you do that for a week, the next week you add in kind of a more complex task. Only in like the third or fourth week would I suggest doing some productive work. So a longer period of time uh, at that random time. Because uh, we just want to build that skill of us choosing to take action rather than waiting for the brain to give us permission. Um, you know, similar to what Stefan was talking about a moment ago. Shresha said, how to quickly identify useful thoughts ooh, from useless ones? Mm, thoughts are th just thoughts. Mm. So you said, any thumb rule to identify this and choose your action? No, like thoughts, there is nothing. They are, they are thoughts. They're even any kind of sitting there trying to judge and label them, I wouldn't see as useful. Uh, Brad Pitt, yeah, you said, can I ask you questions about OCD on Instagram? Yep, you can ask them there too. Yeah, if you post them, so you can send me a DM. Um, I do, so I have an Instagram subscriber channel now, uh, which has been, I've really enjoyed that. So I, I haven't been posting as much on the regular Instagram channel. And I think, yeah, because it is really, uh, I guess so it's, yeah, inter it's both interesting uh, and yeah, just a, I would say a more fulfilling social media experience uh, to be, yeah, kind of working with a, a group of people in the subscriber channel, like where we're just 
they're making more in-depth content, like really about making changes as opposed to, uh, yeah, just kind of content for views, which the main channel can kind of turn into. Uh, so yeah, I've been really enjoying that. So I do answer uh, the questions from the subscribers. So like often we'll have kind of ongoing uh, discussion threads about changes that people are working on. Uh, but yeah, also if you post a question, yeah, under an Instagram post, I will, uh, I will answer that as well. Shresha, yeah, you said, I'm trying to understand identifying core fears. Can you explain it a bit? So I think one of the things to watch out for is that people will be looking for something about a core fear is this special uh, kind of discovery or insight that does something on its own. Well, it doesn't. It's not that, oh, I, I, I get my core fear. Oh, everything, all of the compulsions disappear and all of the obsessions go away and something like that. No, the reason I would say it's really useful to identify those core root fears is because then we see all the actions that are fueling them, all of the, what I like to call normal compulsions. Uh, so fears around social anxiety are a great example. So yeah, say the core fear is, like, oh no, I'm gonna be alone. Uh, I'm gonna be, yeah, like everybody's gonna hate me. Uh, like I'll just, yeah, not have social relationships or something like that. Uh, and so there's all sorts of ways we might interact with that fear in our everyday lives. Like even if we're getting ready in the morning and we might not see it as an issue at first, but maybe as we're picking clothes, as we're taking care of uh, our bodies, grooming, et cetera, even how we're eating breakfast, if we're always thinking about what are other people going to think about how I look, uh, my body, what I'm eating, et cetera. That's a great example of very normal compulsions we're doing to control the fear of being alone. That practice, especially if we're doing something like that every morning, we're kind of devoting an hour or two every morning to the fear of what will other people think about me, then it's completely natural that the brain is going to be on high alert for anything that could lead to that fear in other areas of our life. And so when we identify a core fear like that, what we do is look throughout our everyday lives at all of the different ways we're fueling that and then start to make changes in those other areas. Uh, so yeah, basically it's just an opportunity. It's not like it's the end of work, like oh, I found my core fear, I have reached the end. No, really it's the start of the work. We identify those core fears so that we see a lot of areas in life that we're gonna make some pretty big changes around. Like switching from like trying to get people to like me to instead maybe giving things to myself or giving things to others. Marlos is on what color was the robe in the dream? You said the robe was brown. It was dark brown. Okay, that's good to know, Marlos. And there was a, a couple sitting in a place you wanted to sit and then you filmed having a polite argument <laughs> about them not wanting to leave and you wanting to sit. I, I probably would want to sit down. I like, I like to sit. I appreciate, I appreciate you sharing that dream with us. I hope, I'm glad the, the argument with them was polite. Uh, Dave, greetings. Thanks for joining us. Brad Pitt, hey, he said, is there anyone experiencing false memory OCD? Can we chat and answer, please? Oh, so for false memory, actually, Brad, I would say there's a video on my channel. Um, yeah, if you look up uh, on my channel, false memory bananas, um, yeah, you'll, uh, you'll find a video uh, which can really answer all of your questions about false memories. Oh, Dave, thank, thank you for the, the, the recommendation shout out. Shresha said, I find listening to people difficult as I observe myself drawn to thinking about what will I speak in response? I want to change this habit. Uh, any suggestions? Yeah, we'll just look at it. So there's a great example of, yeah, look, why do you think you need to know what you're going to say? What are you trying to get from that? Um, and what if you didn't have to get that? Alex347 said, uh, hello, your channel helped me so much with OCD. Thank you. Oh, Alex, you're welcome. I'm glad it was helpful. Siobhan, 
He said, are these following things enough for curing OCD 100%? I will stop you right there. Any, you could see like the question is the, like that, I, I want to find the soap that will clean things 100%. Uh, and so, yeah, it's, that's not going to be useful. Because, uh, yeah, then you said ERP, uh, two, not connecting your identity and emotions and letting them go without getting engaged. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've been like putting out ERP, like what, what does ERP mean to you? Uh, why are you trying to cure OCD? Like what are you even seeing that as meaning? I wouldn't start with these things you mentioned. The first thing I would look at is what do you actually want to be doing in life? So if we said tomorrow, there's no OCD, there's no mental health struggles, any acronym. What do you want to give your time and energy to? And then we can start to work backwards from that. Okay, what are the things that need to change so you can do that? What are the challenges to build skills around to go there? Then we can see the things that are going to help take you there. But we can't see that separate from where you want to go. Like just looking at an acronym and be like, oh, is this going to clean away the acronym? What do you want to be doing? And then we can look at how to go there. Dave, he said, I'm concerned about giving up rumination as I've not yet received my rumination trophy. <laughs> Does anyone know where to collect these? Oh, please, I hope somebody can, can put together a really nice one, like kind of gold painted, uh, at least. Maybe, maybe some bronze, uh, really shiny with like maybe a big cup, but maybe like a statue doing some thinking. Oh yeah, maybe it should be like a bronze of the thinker, the like Rodin statue, maybe something like that, or just somebody, somebody holding a prize, because surely if they did a lot of ruminating, they must have won something for it. Good luck, good luck collecting this, the uh, the trophy, Dave. Heron Montes, yeah, he said owning a business requirements requires me to do lots of thinking, planning, just plain spending a lot of time in my head. Feels like it causes me to practice overthinking. I find it challenging to switch it off. Yeah, so actually all the, the, all right, so not all, a large percent of the exercises that I share with people actually come from business consulting and innovation, precisely because people thinking about their business is a thoroughly demonstrated uh, way to not come up with good business ideas. We are much more effective at managing businesses, at doing innovative things, when we're following values and objective data outside of our heads. Uh, and so doing what's called visual thinking can really help, where the thinking happens outside of our heads in a structured process, as opposed to us doing the thinking um, and so, yeah, there's a, there's a bunch of great books that can be useful to start exploring doing business strategy outside of your head. One that could be fun to look at is called Business Model Generation, uh, which is a, also a, a popular way just to visualize how your business works together. But also, I'd say anybody doing any kind of thing for another person. Uh, business model generation can be a, a useful book because you're really just looking at how do we create a thing that is actually something somebody needs uh, and then how do all the pieces fit together and work together uh, because yeah spending all that time in our head doesn't we just end up doing stuff that we can think about uh, that we've done before Eleven Tree Lover Eleven. You said, "I feel like scary thoughts come with urges. How do you sit with that and not attach meaning to it?" Yeah, that's a great opportunity to look at beliefs you have and even how you're labeling stuff. Because if we have some belief like, "Ooh, you shouldn't have an urge with a scary thought," then it's very natural that we're going to be checking. We're like, "Ooh, was that an urge? Did I feel something around that thought?" And then, of course, we're going to find it because then we're going to do a bunch of compulsions and stuff like that. So really just starting to see that whole framework of the beliefs and the checking stuff like that. Uh, 
there's going to be a lot of changes around all of that. The Velociraptor, thanks so much for the donation. Oh, I appreciate I appreciate you stopping by the live stream. Thank you. Look, Beth, you said, when I want to make friends in real life, not on the internet, if I greet them, I don't have anything to say anymore. I automatically think they're judging how stupid I look, how to build up self-esteem. Well, so I wouldn't look at building up the self-esteem before, right? Because again, we get this idea, I've got to get some special feeling. Uh, it's going to be more useful to look at spending time with people and not doing that judging compulsion stuff you mentioned there. Uh, can it be okay to allow yourself to like not know what to say? Because if you put that pressure to have certainty about what you're going to say, then you create uncertainty. Uh, but yeah, it's totally normal not to know what to say. We can just be there uh, and not judge and hate on ourselves. Marlos, thank you for wishing us a good day. You have one as well. Shresha said thinking bananas to sh Everybody, we're coming up on the end of the chat, or I have come to the end of the chat. And yeah, we're coming up on two hours. So now's a good time to wrap things up. We can go out and be in nature, not just artificial tree nature behind me, but real nature. Thank you to everybody for stopping by. Uh, to uh, Martina and Deb and Delosiraptor. And thank you so much for the donations. I really appreciate that. If I forgot anybody else that donated, I'm sorry. Thank you as well. Thank you, everybody, for sharing your questions and the adventures happening in your brain. It continues to be a weird experience and a difficult and challenging experience uh, for so many people in the world navigating systems they don't control uh, that are making it really difficult to live uh, so yeah let's make it easy for ourselves um, and then try to share that ease with other people sometimes we'll often think about other people aren't running into any challenges and we'll believe like nobody has you know challenges or thoughts like I do, uh, but yeah, it's pretty common. It's way more common that people are struggling with difficult things in their brain than people are not, and difficult things around them uh, than they're not. So yeah, let's make things easy for other people in the world and the world itself. Oh, Pump Pump Kitty, I appreciate it. Everybody, thank you for the thanks and sharing those things with each other. It's really good to see you all. Feel free to send over any questions on the, uh, the social medias. And I will see you, uh, I guess, two weeks from now. We'll be back here, back here on YouTube. Until then, thank you, everybody. <laughs>